The following interview was conducted with Dr. Lindley Wagner for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, August 20th, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank and, you, uh, Catherine. And tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and your parents and siblings. Well, th thank you for inviting me for this occasion. Uh, I was born in Marion, Indiana. I was the seventh of seven children. Wow. And uh, when I was delivered. It was the same physician who had delivered all seven. And at the time, uh, mother was expecting another girl. We, she'd had four girls and two boys ahead of me. And uh, when she was expecting the girl, she had a girl's name and didn't have a name. So um, when Dr. Eshelman delivered and said, what shall we name this boy? And she said, I don't know. He says, well, since I've done all seven, let's call him Lindley Heath, which is his name. And mom said, that's great, we'll, we'll call him then nickname of Lynn. And he said, no, you won't, you'll call him Doc. So uh, I became the Doc of the Seven Dwarfs at, uh, <laughs> in Marion, Indiana in 1934. <laughs> and so when that's mom introduced me to my brothers and sisters, she said, this is your brother Doc. And so um, maybe later in the interview, I'll come back to that sure. because there's a, a, a point in my life where the use of Lynn or Doc makes a difference, and I will bring that up then. So Okay, then uh, tell about school, your early school, and then a little bit about high school, where you went to high school. Okay, well, I was uh, fortunate. Um, my folks were a baking factory, or um, had their own bakery with my grandparents, and uh, we were a block from the city school, which was uh, elementary junior high school, McCullough Elementary Junior High School all together in one building. So all of us had gone from kindergarten through the ninth grade, one block from home, which was really wonderful. Very nice, yeah. And uh, I was very fortunate to be born with uh, uh, very Christian parents and uh, had a very wonderful life in, in uh, my grade school and in junior high school and uh, graduated from Marion High School. And I mentioned to you a few minutes tell, ago about... Uh, yeah, you tell, uh, tell us, when, excuse me, in high school, were there any activities, athletics or student yes, clubs? Yes, uh, there were several yeah. things. Uh, when I was a freshman at the junior high school uh, in my ninth grade, I was uh, running cross country for the junior high school and I was uh, doing a good enough job that I was also running on the varsity team for the high school simultaneously which today they wouldn't permit that to happen because some of the meets were on the same day. And, <laughs> but uh, I was doing very well, but unfortunately in, in that course of that year, uh, at the end, toward the end of the track season, uh, I had, uh, had had a congenital hernia and then running against the state champion. And I was sure I was gonna beat him that day. And, and I what, did for three quarters of a mile until my hernia popped out and I couldn't reduce it. I ended up with surgery before the night was over, and that that ended my athletic career. But uh, you know, it was one of those things uh, the, as refer you might refer to as a bend in the road that uh, sure. that God had other things in store for me. And so um, I had started playing drums as a very small boy because my oldest sister was married to a, a pharmacist who was also a drummer in a in an orchestra played it. Uh, weekends up at Monticello and so I took up the drums as about a six-year-old and so I pursued music in high school became uh, um, in both orchestra and the band and became the drum major of the band wrote halftime shows formations for the band and uh, okay. really enjoyed those things. Oh, yeah. and, a lot uh, of camaraderie with yes, that. Yes and uh, and then uh, the uh, edit the uh, a teacher in charge of the yearbook asked if I were interested in being the yearbook editor, so I became the yearbook editor. So those two things were a really wonderful sure. part sure. of my, Good my time in high school and, and later became very apropos to what my education career led into and, mm -hmm. and part of my music career too, which I've had. Uh, so uh, I had a, a wonderful time. With, I went to Bloomington, and I mentioned to you a few minutes ago that I was uh, born as a Quaker, and I received the, the Quaker uh, scholarship to Earlham College. And as I was looking at going to college for a medical career and pre-med, uh, one of the 
friends in Marion said, you know, you should talk to, to a, one of the doctors in town who is on the board of trustees at IU, and he might give you some insight into medical school. So I did, I met with him, and I told him what I'd like to do, and he said, you go to Earlham, you'll never get into IU School of Medicine. He said, in fact, most of the people they take into the IU School of Medicine at that time, 1952, uh, have a background of pre-med from Bloomington. And he said, so I would recommend you go to Bloomington. So I enrolled in Bloomington and uh, uh, totally different than what I might have done in in the smaller place of sure. Earlham at Richmond. Right. But um, I had a very good career. I took uh, I was fortunate to get into medical school after only three years of pre-med instead of four years of pre-med. I became president of the junior class down in Bloomington. Um, spent time with President Wells as a class officer, which was a wonderful experience, mm -hmm. and started my medical school in uh, 1955. In 1956, uh, combined my anatomy physiology with my other undergraduate work and got an AB out of the School of Arts and Science and then completed my medical school in 1959. Okay. After Tell us um, back on the uh, college, were there any, any other activities or what was the campus like and did you live on campus? I lived in the dorm. Okay. Uh, at that time, I paid all my own expenses for college. I, could wor I worked full time at the, in, the, in the dorm dining room for the meals. Um, I also uh, um, became an officer within the student government within the, the dormitory governor for our unit. Um, I was active in, in the yearbook there since I had the, year, sure. the background in high school. So I was very active on campus. Uh, I was also a, a spectator sports fan. I was very fortunate the first year down, we I got there in the fall of 52, well the 52-53 season was uh, one of those fabulous IU basketballs that in 1953, my first spring, they won the NCAA. <laughs> so, uh, and that's interesting because a, a friend I met uh, working in the dining room from Passaic, New Jersey, was enrolled there at school, became a lawyer, and a lawyer in Indianapolis. and. And uh, Al called me two weeks ago and he said, I'm sending you a book about the IU basketball team of 1952-53. He said, this is a wonderful book and you'll relive every moment in it because we lived <laughs> oh, yeah. it oh, and yeah. we did. And, <laughs> and uh, he was right. We lived every moment of that particular book. So, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Then after, uh, now, after med school, then what, tell us what was next. Okay. Well, <clears> next in in med school um, after graduation and it's time for an internship. At that time we were still doing internships. Today they don't do internships, it's a different system, but uh, at that time I spent a year at Methodist Hospital. So essentially that's the only year since 1952 that I was not directly associated with Indiana University and in my, the rest of my life. And so in that year, uh, that was uh, a learning year as an intern. And it was such a learning year that uh, toward the end, of the, that was 1960, 61, uh, finished in July, uh, June 30th. Of, but um, May 30th, uh, the, the race, the Indianapolis race, um, I was the intern assigned to the Methodist Hospital emergency room for race day. And it started out as a very quiet morning. I Were had, you at the track, or uh, well, this was at the hospital emergency room on 16th Street. Now, okay. The race, the track is on 16th Street in Speedway. Okay. So they close all the intersections on 16th during the race. Becomes a one way to the hospital from the track. It did at that time, and I think they still do a lot of that. Although there's more done at the track hospital now than there was at that sure. time. But that particular race was uh, my morning started with one individual from Muncie came in with a kidney stone. And I'd sent him up to x-ray and it was time for the race to start. The race started and they had, fans had built this multi-level scaffolding, metal scaffolding like you see uh, workers use on buildings and they had two by 12 planks on it. They built it on the first curve and when the race started they all stood up and the whole thing fell over. They were st there were like 85 people on this scaffolding of multi-layers. And 
terrible head injuries, leg injuries, broken arms, broken legs, oh. back injuries, and uh, the head nurse of the emergency room says, Doc, you've got a real problem on your heads. We've got a tragedy out at the track and the ambulances have started up 16th Street now. And so sure enough, they start arriving and the, the oh. medical help at the track simply tied a lot of these people to these two by 12 boards and because of the back injuries and their broken limbs and all and brought them in the ambulances with the doors open bringing them right in and so all of a sudden I think you know what am I going to do and all of a sudden we have more physicians and nurses than I could ever imagine existed in the hospital I mean I said Maxine what's going on she said oh I put the disaster plan in action well that became another phase of my life of working through most of my medical career in disaster planning and mm -hmm. disaster programs for here in Tippecanoe with the ambulances, the ambulances that we are hearing about today sure. in our news. Uh, I worked it was the chairman of the committee to establish our first ambulances and so on. And But uh, um, that was a wonderful experience for me. And all along the way, God has put experiences that would pay off later for something. For sure. My, my next, uh, I went back to the medical center at the end of the internship and and had a residency in internal medicine. And while I was in my internal medicine residency, well, actually, in my career when, as a kid, um, our middle sister in 1975, and I was 11 years old, uh, actually started in 1970, in 19, uh, excuse me, 1944. 1944, she contracted tuberculosis, died in 1945. And in How that, old in, was she? and she was a senior in high school at the time. And at TB, tuberculosis, we had no treatment for tuberculosis at that time. My uh, next oldest sister at the same time was a, a nursing student over at Ball uh, at Muncie, at uh, um, the, the uh, Ball nursing program. And uh, when she graduated, she, she started her career nursing Joanne until Joanne died. Well, whenever Betty would come home while she was in school, I would read her anatomy physiology books and her pharmacology books and her microbiology and her medical dictionary as a 10 and 11 year old and I knew I was going into medicine and that's why I was certain when I graduated from high school what I was going Very to do. Good. Got a and leg up. That's right, right. <laughs> and yeah, I was that little boy on radio that did radio ads for the Tuberculosis Association <laughs> back in 1940. Oh, very good. Yes. <laughs> I used to read the scripts on it as to why you should contribute to the TV Association, <laughs> which is now the American Lung Association. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wasn't so. it, there, there were sanitariums at that time? Yes, but in that fact, didn't... Joanne spent her last year oh. at Fort Wayne in the sanitarium, and uh, there they did things like uh, there was no drug. The only drug that was effective was uh, sulfa, but it was in Europe for the army, and they could not get it for civilian oh. use, so it was not available. And uh, so hers was all the treatments that they did at that time, which was collapsed lungs and and uh, the air, the uh, lots, atmosphere, and the right the lots beds. of air, right, mm -hmm. right, open window treatment. Uh, That's right. Yeah, because uh, I'm originally from Cleveland, and there was a sanitarium, and I knew I've, my parents told me of some people that were out there, and it was similar. Mm -hmm. that, that's the way they were set up. Right, and that's sure. the way it was with Joanne. Sure. She spent the time there until right. she died. Then and hers was. It was really unfortunate because. There were five in her class who came down with TB, and they traced it back to a, a little restaurant that was there a block from the high school. The waitress in there had active tuberculosis oh, wow. and had infected the students. And Joanne got the worst case of it. And, oh, dear. Yeah, so. That's tragic. But then after I finished, uh, while I was uh, um, in those young days with Joanne, I read a lot of Albert Schweitzer's books. I used to really enjoy reading mm -hmm. Albert Schweitzer and, and some of my English composition papers that I had to write. I wrote them on medical topics, go to the library and get books and sure. write on those. And, uh, and one of them that I spent a lot of time reading was on the pituitary gland and, and the uh, secretion of cortisone and the 
the alarm reaction and those things by hand sell you, and I'll come back to that a little later too, because okay. that yeah. plays a part of my later life okay. and uh, part of my retirement. But uh, um, while I was in medical school, I was very fortunate that um, in my junior year, I was assigned to Dr. John Hickam in the Internal Medicine Service. I had wanted to be a medical missionary because of what I read with Schweitzer. And uh, when I was with John Hickam, one of the top internists in the country had come from Duke University to IU as head of the Department of Internal Medicine. And I was assigned to him as a junior student. And my, what a marvelous diagnostician. And I, the more I worked with him, the more I wanted to, to be live there. his life. Sure. It was so wonderful. And so uh, um, as a senior, I was reassigned to him a second time. So I spent a total of six months, three in my junior, three in my senior year with him. And I knew internal medicine was what I wanted, sure. not missionary medicine. I wanted internal medicine, similar to, to Dr. Hickam. And um, so that's the field I, but when while I was doing the rest of my residency along with that, uh, I mean, when I, then when I became a resident, that was a medical student, when I became a resident, um, I was rotating through the various specialties and I rotated through gastroenterology, which was a brand new department on the campus. Uh, Dr. Phil Christensen had come from University of Chicago to start a gastroenterology department at IU. And so as I rotated through his service, um, it was his first year. He said to me and, and one of my fellows who had, was with me in medical school and internship and all, said, would you two fellows like to spend a year with me in clinical gastroenterology as a fellowship? And we both said, sure, we'd be glad to do that. So uh, Jim spent the year, I spent the year. Jim went to Muncie in internal medicine gastroenterology. I came to Lafayette in internal medicine gastroenterology. A really neat thing in that year was that uh, NASA had been working on fiber optic use for their space capsules uh, to be able to determine the, the space capsule, capsule being a circular thing. They needed a way to look inside the metal frame of that and look for defects. So they created fiber optics and a fiber scope that they could insert and make it go around the curves. Well, that was carried a little further into gastroenterology to replace the old straight, uh, rigid um, gastroscope that you would have to lie the patient back on a table and put this okay. like a sword straight through on a straight line to look inside the stomach. Well, the fiber optics, could you could have the patient upright. You could have them lying on a side. You could have them doing anything and curve that through there. So. Uh, that came to IU that year while Jim and I were there, and so we both got to use it, but Jim wasn't so fascinated by it as I was, and so I got to do all the gastroscopies at the IU Med Center, which was uh, at that time General Hospital, uh, Riley for kids, and, and Long Hospital for adults, and the VA hospital. So I did lots of gastroenterology there, a lot of, of gastroscopies and came to Lafayette with the very first fiber optic equipment for Lafayette, Indiana. Yeah. And so... Uh, this is where you started and wasn't... How did you happen to decide on Lafayette? Well, when I was a junior student, I had a three months vacation. And on that three months vacation, I came to Lafayette and worked in the emergency room at St. Elizabeth oh, okay. Hospital. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was a senior, I repeated that on my... At that time, the seniors had three months off also. And I came, and it was a good way to earn money to pay sure. my education, and it was a good learning. Sure. And the same way when I was here, I, I was placed with the very best physicians in town, and it was just a great experience mm -hmm. for me. So that's why I came here. Okay. So then when I finished my uh, clinical fellowship in gastroenterology and my internal medicine residency, I came to Lafayette to practice and started my own solo practice. I was one of the brave ones. I went by myself and started internal medicine gastroenterology, which I continued to practice until I slowed it down in 74 as I became more and more involved into this program. Okay. But during that time, and, and that's really part of what led to my becoming involved in the teaching program, was uh, the fact that when 
I came here to practice, uh, Dr. Christensen asked me if I would return to the Med Center during the time when they're teaching second year students gastroenterology and be a lecturer for them. I said, sure, I'll work that out. And so I did for mm -hmm. a few years. I would go back during that period of time and uh, teach the lectures and, and the GI exam to the medical students. So I kept a, 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 an instructorship position with the medical school. Well, that was good. As well good as my, yeah. it was, it really worked out well. Mm -hmm. and, and so then uh, going on from there as to how did I get involved with Purdue? Well, uh, we were at St. Elizabeth's, weren't you in the medical edu uh, medical education there? For the teaching was that at, yes, at home? Okay. Yes, and what happened was that when I started practice, I was used to coming from a teaching program where once a week we would have grand rounds and take turns presenting our patients for discussion to a group of physicians and pick a lot of people's brains on management sure. of difficult cases. And so um, um, Dr. Fred Kuyper is a cardiologist with the Arnett Clinic, uh, was here in practice in the uh, um, coronary care units just came into being in, in my last year of residency at the medical center. Um, so we worked with with uh, CPR and the, the various resuscitation procedures at the medical center before I came here. Uh, so again, I was at the right place at right. the right time. And so so I worked with Fred some on and I said, Fred, you know, I sure miss the grand rounds things. Why don't, why don't we start getting together on Wednesday morning and and you tell me a difficult case, and I'll tell you a difficult case, and we'll see if we can get other internists and family physicians and interested in doing this. And so we did, and it just went, I mean, when the physician said, hey, this is great. So we would meet on Wednesday morning and, and take turns presenting a difficult and get other opinions on it. And it worked out great. And so um, when uh, about the, uh, um, so they they added me to their education committee at Saney and at Home Hospital both. We we had staff privileges in both hospitals. Mm -hmm. All the physicians here did at the sure. time, and uh, so as we started um, in in uh, early 1969, uh, in one of our education meetings, uh, one of the physicians, one of the obstetricians, in fact, said said, you know, we need to have such a program as to what Wagner's doing for internists and family physicians. We ought to do that for obstetricians and, and for something for surgeons and something for pediatricians. And we ought to have some one physician coordinate it all. And since, since Lindley started this thing off, uh, and they pointed a, he pointed his finger at me and said, would you be interested in, in doing such a thing? <laughs> With your experience. And I said, well, I, I would give it a try. He said, okay, he said, um, why don't, what does the committee think? The committee says, that sounds like a good idea. Next week at the committee over at the home hospital, let's bring it up there too and, and let's have him do it for both of them. Instead of having separate ones, let's have one program. And so out of that grew the position of director of medical education for St. Elizabeth Hospital and the part-time the same way at home hospital. And so at the same time, I was president of the County Medical Society and in 1968, uh, Indiana University School of Medicine and the state legislature were looking at, at uh, what can we do to increase the number of medical students in the IU program. And at that time, like my class had 150 graduating students and that's not enough to supply the state. And so uh, the uh, legislature got involved with the School of Medicine. The School of Medicine wanted more facilities and the legislature said, we don't have money to build facilities. You gotta come up with a different idea. And so IU talked with Purdue, uh, Dean Fred Andrews uh, in the graduate school, Dean of the Graduate School. And they worked out in 1968, they had three students out of the IU School of Medicine class that they assigned them to, to this campus as their first year, and there was nothing. They said, well, what do, we, what do we do with them? Well, we want to put them in your biochemistry, and we want to put you in, put them into your physiology, and see 
how much they could learn. And in the summer, we'll take them back to, to Indianapolis and teach them anatomy and see, can students learn off the IU main campus? It was kind of an experiment. And, sure. and those were brave students to do that. And thanks to uh, people like Dr. Bill Pack and uh, uh, the uh, physiology here and uh, Dr. Van Sickle over in the vet school for histology and uh, uh, Dr. Mark Hermanson in biochemistry out of the School of Agriculture, they included these students into their classes and it was successful. So the next year in 1969, they sent uh, four students to do that and that was successful. And in the course of 69, um, I became director of medical education and Dr. Steve Beering had been hired by IU from the NASA program in Houston to uh, be in charge of continuing medical education for the state from the medical school standpoint. So he calls me when he learned I was director of medical education at St. Ian Home Hospital and wanted to get me involved with IU and he knew I was already going down to teach in the first year students and the second year introduction to medicine students. And so we started working together and he was director of the statewide continuing medical education for Indiana University School of Medicine. And so how did that developed uh, with the state legislature and with thanks with Fred Andrews, Fred got me involved and uh, got me on the governor's commission for higher education that was studying the commission of the medical education portion on the subcommittee for that. So I became involved at that level then. At the same time, I still have my private practice, I'm still doing the conferences here, and we're doing all these things, you know, at one time. <laughs> when you look back, I think, wow. <laughs> and so it was like a three ring circus, and the, uh, but uh, I was able to keep it up. And so then, uh, and Fred Hovde was president here at the time, and uh, and he was encouraging us that uh, maybe we could develop something out of this with the state. And, and so out of all this came the Indiana plan in which uh, the legislature said, again, we won't give you money for buildings, but we'll give you money to get a program started. And so uh, um, at that time, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Haas was, uh, um, School of Science. Felix Haas. Felix Haas was the School of Science. Um, and uh, um, Fred Andrews, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, School of Agriculture, um, uh, who was the dean at that time? Um, I can't, it slips me now. I, I can't remember if, uh, can't remember. who was, but anyway. But they uh, were involved. But they were because of the biochemistry, sure. the biochem department. And uh, and then in the vet school, uh, Dean Stockton with uh, the histology, and and so so we could uh, have a room to teach anatomy. Uh, there were no facilities on campus for us, so we said, well, "What are we going to do? We need we need to develop for gross anatomy the first thing to add into what you're already doing." And so we took up one area in the basement at that time, which was a dirt floor. Of this the is vet in school, Lynn Hall. In Lynn Hall in Lynn Hall, and that was the newest building on campus, and uh, built a little building with cement blocks, I mean a little wall, and made that gross anatomy. And so so now we're, we're really functioning, we think. Well, that's still not enough. So so we finally were able to convince the, and by this time they had hired me as a part-time director for the program to get it off the ground, and kept all my other work too. And so 1971 comes along and they say, uh, IU says, we're going to send you six medical students and we want you to do everything. We want the whole works here. Well, we looked for the future and the future said, the only place we can go is to excavate beneath the vet school, Lynn Hall. So we excavated below the basement down to the water level the water table level. <laughs> if you go over there now, you'll see that uh, you still will see the the pipes in the ceiling of the hallway because we can't go I've any lower. <laughs> we can't put a ceiling up there. We really need a facility. Yeah. We desperately need a facility. But but we've managed now since 1971 sure. to have students there. For, right. So uh, uh, so as the program came along, then 
um, Bering became dean of the medical school, and as he became dean of the medical school, he thought that um, uh, the IU program, um, as it expanded, we had students here, we had students uh, in Gary. So at that time, also other yes, we produced that first or opened year, at the same in time. In '71, uh, we started with the center here, then at Gary, at uh, Muncie, at Terre Haute. Evansville, and uh, we already had students down in Bloomington before that time. And uh, Fort Wayne was to be part of it, but Fort Wayne felt that they didn't have what all the rest of us had, that they could just jump right in and start out with the students. Because the Fort Wayne IU Center uh, it, there was, was more for undergraduate students. And this is the graduate level that right. we're talking about. And so uh, we could easily do that here, I mean, and we had the best. I mean, we had the best here you could find, and uh, and to, we were very unique in this. What I just had mentioned about we were involving a school of agriculture, right. we were involving a school of veterinary medicine, a school of science, and as we added in the second year students, which came along in in 1980, uh, when we added those second year students in, we teach pharmacology. So we added the School of Pharmacy, and we teach pathology, so pathology we added out of the vet school, and uh, um, we just we had all we the were resources. able to use uh, a truly interdisciplinary type approach. Sure. With, uh, and I it was, was already in place. That's right. And um, I guess it was uh, 1972 when IU talked me into becoming a full-time for them. But as full time, that meant I still had private patients. I still had a private practice, but I was also full time with the medical school. And so uh, then as we looked at the total thing, uh, we had senior students coming in to, that uh, were with practicing physicians and we needed a way to coordinate that program. And so they thought that I should be able to coordinate that also. And then uh, we looked at the how can we involve the physicians into all the teaching programs and how can we get grants and so on to do some of these things and uh, uh, so we said we need to form a medical education foundation so we formed the Lafayette Medical Education Foundation in 1973 and uh, I became the originally founding coordinator of that for the next 25 years so uh, that was another one of the balls to keep bouncing and that expanded into nursing education into various technical fields uh, for example uh, I mentioned the ambulances earlier yes uh, you were going to mention about that, that. Uh, we had uh, the undertakers were the ambulances here and then a private company developed an ambulance service and then in uh, in 73 I believe it was uh, um, the uh, Department of Transportation said we've got to change our whole way of ambulance service in this country that we learned from the Korean War and from Vietnam that it's you, you don't just throw people into an ambulance and get them to the nearest facility you stabilize them first and then take them and the survival is much improved and so so uh, the physicians the hospital administrators the uh, um, Purdue administration and, and uh, other here in town uh, lead business leaders said pointed their finger to me and they said you put together for us an ambulance service you work on what what the Department of Transportation is now telling us that ambulances should be so I formed the nucleus committee and and we put our heads together and formed the yeah. Got the ambulances. Is it before that there weren't any? The hospitals did not have ambulances. No, no, they they did not. No, That's no. Interesting. An, an interesting thing that way was was uh, when I started practice. Um, one of my early patients was the manager of the local Howard Johnson at that time, and um, one of the visits after we'd taken care of her medical problems, she said, said, you know, I wonder if you would help us out. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she says. Well, you know, we we get these people driving from Chicago, going to Florida, coming back the other way, and we have a lot of very sick people stay with us, but I have nobody to call to see them. 
would you be interested in being our resident f physician? And our night manager could call you or our day manager if they have a problem and you could advise them what to do. I said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. One of the early patients that they called me for was a gentleman from Chicago who she called about 2 a.m. and said, this fellow is really sick. He's having terrible back pain. Um, what should I do? I said, I'll be right there. I went over, walked in. He was as pale as your white top that you have on. And he was having terrible pain. And I asked him where his pain was. He said, well, it's in my abdomen, but it's going to my back. It's in my back. I put my hand on his abdomen, and he had the pulsations of an abdominal aneurysm. And when, if the pain's going to the back, it means it has ruptured. And he was really in trouble. He was white because his circulation wasn't. Right, he yeah. didn't have enough blood. He was losing blood from this aneurysm. I call the ambulance. It's the funeral home. And this is another thing that made me be more than happy to work with the community and getting ambulance service because I call and they come, but there's nothing we could do at the time. I meanwhile, Just transport while them. I'm waiting for them to come, I call one of our best general surgeons in town and say, here's the situation. I think I've got a patient who has an abdominal aneurysm who's bleeding out and he needs to go straight to surgery. We got him in the ambulance, got him over to Saney, which was real close to Howard Johnson, sure. the old Howard Johnson out there on 52. Right. And, uh, he took him right up to to the operating room. They had it. They were they were ready to go when the patient got there, and when they opened him up, the blood was he's dead. Well, today we could have saved that man. We could have stabilized him, and we would have had fluids running on him to get him to the hospital. Got kept his volume up as we could. Uh, the techniques and all uh, so much better today. We right. could have saved that man, but. Right. Uh, um, huh, that was a that so was a funeral home. Wow. You know that's the way it was. Yeah. Well, another interesting thing with the funeral homes came along as we were excavating this basement or to make the facility at school. Uh, the local coroner uh, came to me and said, uh, "I understand you're building a facility. What would you think if we put the if we had a county morgue? We don't have a county morgue. We go to funeral homes. You know, wherever wherever the body goes, that's where the pathologist goes and does the autopsy. <laughs> oh um, wow! <laughs> so so we incorporated into our plans. Uh, you need another the, place. The county morgue, <laughs> right. and so that worked out great. <laughs> and so we've had the county morgue there as part of our yeah. facility. It's still there, is it not? And it actually, they have moved it. Oh. After I retired, they oh. moved it to the county jail, the old county jail. Oh, the old county jail. The old jail that's down on, on what, 8th Street or something like something that. Something down yeah. there. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, which is unfortunate because we incorporated it with our gross anatomy. We put it right side door from a door in, right into it from the gross anatomy lab. And so the students could could learn from the autopsies, and, and we assigned the students to the autopsies so they would to, wherever they are when it's being done, they could go there and be with the pathologists, sure. and right. and we just incorporated them in as much right. as we could. Mm -hmm. One of the things that with the students that they they're enrolled at Purdue and their grad their their status as graduates, so they can avail themselves of all the facilities. Yes, which was which is nice. Yes, that and was they a, a real plus. They merged right in in there, so that was That's pretty a good. a real plus in the program. Right. Uh, back when uh, when the state was trying to decide what to do, and they they sent some students down to Bloomington and started a combined degree program in which they they worked on MDs and PhDs together. And so after we became involved in this, and being the, the great graduate schools that we have on this campus, this became a natural for us. So we included into our program combined degree students also. And it's worked out very well. It was back in the early 70s, uh, Dr. Geddes right. uh, was down at Baylor with his group with Dr. Tacker and Dr. Babs and looking at here for um, uh, coming here for a, to start a biomedical engineering department, and uh, they came by my office when they were looking at Purdue and met with me as could we and somehow involve them with us, and yes, absolutely, sure. and so we did, and so they have had quite a few combined mm -hmm. degree students come through theirs, but that made them 
accessible then for the whatever's on this campus to right. be available to those students, sure. and that's been very, very right. good for our students. What about the faculty? What did uh... the faculty? I started to mention earlier uh, in '72 when IU convinced me to come full time with sure. them. Um, we looked at salaries and, and faculty, and we said, "Well, you know, if we are going to have our own faculty." We're going to have to have more space on campus, and, and we don't have room for faculty in this modified basement that we have. Um, so instead, we took the route of part-time faculty. And we have averaged about 32 to 35 Purdue faculty members uh, by buying part of their time to teach in our program. And that's been very successful. Yeah, sure. That's that works been very, out very good. Well. Do you still do you have some people from uh, uh, Indianapolis that come and teach some courses? Not, or, no, not too many. Not too many. Most okay. are right here in you campus. Have a, yeah. Well, that's pretty good. That's yeah, worked out extremely most well. Most of us have been right here. Right. Yes, it's been very good that sure. way. And this, uh, you now have the, the two years, and have the numbers of students increased? It's uh, we started. the The goal was to have twenty in each class, twenty first year and twenty second year. We did make it up to, to 20 at one point, but then they, the school dropped it back down to 16, and 16's been the, the number. They're now looking at going back to the 20 again, and they're also looking at, we, we've had the fourth year students in the community. Um, we haven't had the third year students too often, but we've had some third years that have come back in the community. But uh, they're looking at making it a four-year program hmm. and including those students to have their whole four, years, four years here, here with it. Uh, That's interesting. And so uh, it looks like it'll just be a matter of time until that does occur. Sure, right. Do, mm -hmm. uh, do many of the students stay on in Indiana when they finish? Far more than used to, and that okay. was one of the things back in the 1960s. To in uh, the and large that's the move now to keep people to stay here. The, the the interim residency programs, and now it's mainly it's residency because most residency programs, the first year is a general, what used to be the old called internship, and now it's it's first year, graduate year one. Sure. And uh, uh, we didn't have enough programs to handle the number of students we had, so they go out of state. And rather than for students to stay where they go to medical school, for their practice, they're more likely to stay where they do their residency or fellowship, whichever, they're both. And so here, though, when, at, when I retired in 68, I can't tell you what the number is right now, but in 68 when I retired, we had 25 of our students were practicing here in Lafayette. And all those students are still practicing yeah, here. That's very, that's very good. Yes, that's really very good. so. Yeah, that speaks so, well. So that, uh, we felt good about that, considering they didn't take residencies right. here. And uh, yet they came here to practice right, yeah. because they remembered their good <laughs> medical while uh, they were here as students. Yeah. What's we been doing since you retired? Well, since I retired... How many uh, balls are you bouncing now? <laughs> <laughs> not quite as many as that, but uh, uh, and it was interesting that uh, in 1993, um, for about an eight-year period leading up to 83, I had slowly been running out of gas and all my medical studies, my physicians all said, well, you're working 80 hours plus a week, so what do you expect, you know? And, and there's nothing really wrong with you. And uh, then in uh, 1993, I was down at the medical center for a meeting. I was walking across the campus, and uh, uh, the lady ahead of uh, physician relations with the IU School of Medicine saw me and came running over to me and she said, oh, Dr. Wagner, I've been trying to, I've been meaning to call you, but I haven't tried to call you yet, but I've been meaning to call you because we have a new head in the Department of Neurosurgery and I want to bring him to Lafayette to your neurosurgeons to introduce him. And uh, I've been meaning to call you and see if we could get together. And so I said, well, you know, well what's his name? And she said, Dr. Nelson. He's from Pitts University of Pittsburgh. He's a neurosurgeon and uh, he would like to come meet your neurosurgeons. And I said, well, I'm ahead of continuing at MedEd there also, you know. And uh, why don't I just call him and set up a time for him to come to a conference for us and meet not only the neurosurgeons, but our, all of our physicians, so they all know who this is. 
And she said, okay, I'll leave it in your hands. And so I called him and I introduced myself, invited him to come to conference and make a presentation. I said, what would you like to present? And he said, um, well, he said, I just completed 27 years in University of Pittsburgh doing pituitary tumors. Have you talked about pituitary tumors recently? I said, not for a long time. He said, how about if I pick five cases that illustrate different points of pituitary tumors and present those? I said, that'd be great. So uh, uh, over in the vet school, and uh, Dr. Borgens, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Rich Borgens with the spinal I'm spinal not, cord. I've not met him. Yeah. You know, he's, his research has all been in spinal cord injuries in animals. But to he and I had been talking for a long time before this uh, about eventually getting involved in research on some human studies to see can, can he get regeneration in human cords from all the, the back injuries that occur. And so he, uh, I told him that Dr. Nelson's coming and I said, I want to introduce you to Dr. Nelson. Here's a new head of neurosurgery. Maybe right off the bat, we could get him involved in letting you be working with him and the people at IU on back injuries and spinal cord regeneration in humans. And so he went with me. And we're sitting there and Dr. Nelson is presenting the th first case and I punch Rick and I said, you know, I've got a pituitary tumor. I now have an answer as to what's been happening to me for the last eight years. I said, you know, at times I stand up in front of the class lecturing and I get very lightheaded. I have to, to sit down on the table or at least hold on to the table and they've never found any reason for it. But I said, this is what that patient complained of. I said, I think I've got a tumor. Well, that happened with five different symptoms of these five patients. And at the end of it, Rick thought I was crazy. He thought I was absolutely nuts. And so, so afterwards, I introduced him to Dr. Nelson. And I told Dr. Nelson, I said, you know, I think you just diagnosed my pituitary tumor. And he said, oh, yeah, like when we were in medical school, we always got what we studied. And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, I really think I've got a, for eight years now, I've been having problems of different things that I haven't been able to explain. And the studies, nothing's really abnormal. And I said, right now, I don't have time to come in and see you. We're getting toward the end of the school year. And uh, uh, after we do the tests on the students, I'll be in to see you. Well, the next week I went to, we had medicine conference, the internal medicine conference, and the endocrinologists were in charge of it. And Dr. Poulos, local endocrinologist here at the Arnett Clinic was in charge. And he had just come back from the national meetings of endocrinology and their topic was the endocrine effects of pituitary tumors. And so uh, he presents uh, the material he got from there and they were case studies. And afterwards I said, Jim, here are five reasons why I think I have a pituitary tumor. And he says, you got all those problems? I said, yeah, I have, they've, they've been minimal. And I said, you know, they, they're just like anybody who gets a little lightheaded here or there, sure. or it has this little thing or this little thing. And, and I said, all my studies like thyroid, it's normal, but it's the low normal. My cortisol is normal, but it's the low normal. And I said, the testosterone's normal, but it's the low normal. And I said, I'm anemic. And I said, you know, it's the type of anemia you would see with endocrine problems. And he said, come over to my office. Let me, let me check you over. We go to the office. MRIs had just come into me. He said, let's get an MRI. We get an MRI. And I have six of my medical students with me in the exam while I'm getting the MRI. And I'm lying in that tube and I'm feeling claustrophobic. I'm about to have a panic attack. I'm in there and it's making all this clank, clank, clank noise that the MRI makes. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm lying there looking at the prism and one of my students, uh, Tim Fisher, who's now in practice here in Lafayette, Indiana, Tim outlines on that. I can see the control room and I see Tim outlining this pituitary tumor right there to his uh, the other five students with him and I'm lying there dear God you know oh please be with me I'm settle this panic attack I'm having so I come out of the tube and the radiologist gets my wife and me together and students and says you have a walnut sized pituitary tumor this is a massive tumor and I said well I said you know Dr. Nelson 
at the med center is an expert in this. I said, do me a favor, Bill. I said, call down to radiology at IU and talk to Bob Holden, who eventually became dean of the medical school too, and ask Bob what he has observed from the radiological standpoint of Dr. Nelson's work since he joined the med center campus. They do, and they call me back and said, he's good. He knows what he's doing. So we call, we make a reservation, an appointment with Dr. Nelson, my wife and I, on, and it's on my wife's birthday. We sit in his office and take the MRI down, and, and I'm reflecting back on my high school time with my reading about the pituitary gland and the article I, the, the, that I wrote for, for my journalism for the English class. Right, in English. Yeah. And anyway, uh, he tells my wife, he says, this is a massive tumor. He said, I don't think I can get it all out. He said, he may die on the table. Um, he said he may be blind because it's already in, involving the, the optic nerves. And so he said, I can't guarantee you anything. So um, I can get him on the schedule this, next week. We both look at each other. We look at Dr. Nelson and we say, we can't do it. Next week, we're committed to go to New York with our oldest daughter whose child is three years old and we are staying with her for a week while the kids get their first vacation in three years and we can't cancel that. And he said, I'm hesitant to say go. In fact, I don't think you should, but you got to make the decision. So we said, well, we're going to honor our kids and we're going to go. And so um, we'll be back such and such time. He said, I'm gone that next week, and so it was a month before we had surgery. That was the worst time in my career, and it made me feel to really understand what patients go through when you'd say you have a malignancy and you need surgery, but we can't do it for a while. And when they've got to wait yeah. and wait and wait for a breast malignancy or whatever kind it is, you know. I really started understanding what that was all about. And the Thursday before Monday surgery, I walked out to the mailbox and got our mail, and, and I dropped it in the street. And I reached down to pick it up, and guidepost was the issue of guidepost was there. Now, it always has a little plastic seal, so it stays sealed. It didn't have one on it, and it fell open <laughs> to the thing, Good. a little thing called, this thing called prayer. And it said in this little, it was in a black box, and it talked about this fellow who had a, a lesion in his larynx and all the anxiety he was going through before surgery because they had to delay the surgery. And, and he, it just sounded like what we were doing, you know. And, uh, and he said that he couldn't get any peace, he and his wife, until they finally just turned it over to God and said, it's in your hands. Whatever will be, will be. It's yours. Mm -hmm. And he said, I went to surgery peaceful. They were able to do a good job on it. Here I am years later and doing fine. So Jan and I look at it that way and say, that's what we haven't done, you know? And so we turn it over to God and, uh, and we go in and I go into surgery. And, you know, things have changed from my days of practice when we used to put a patient, have a patient for surgery a couple of days ahead and stabilize them in the hospital before now you walk in and you get right. surgery and all the, which I don't agree with on all of them, but that happened to me. And I walk in on Monday morning and they give me a gown and they say, now put, leave your stuff with your wife and you can put some in this little box over here and blah, blah, and go through that door and you're in the surgery. I walk through that door. I lie down on the operating room table. I'm lying there waiting for the anesthesiologist and one of my former students walks in. And Joe says, oh, Dr. Wagner, I didn't realize this was you that I'm doing this morning. <laughs> I said, hey, Joe, just remember when you were with me, I treated you well. You were a good student. You did well. I gave you good grades. Just forget <laughs> who it is. Just treat me as any other patient. I'm lying there. I look at the operating room clock, and Jesus is standing in that operating room clock with his hands extended. And I look, and I had not had any pre-medication. I had not had, Joe was trying to get the IV started, hadn't given me anything. 
And all I can say is, I'm in your hands. And if this is my time to be with you today, I'll be there. Otherwise, whatever will be, will be. And I awakened later with my vision, uh, with alive, and that's been 15 years. That's very really good. And I saw Dr. Nelson two weeks ago now and had my 15th MRI. And he says he couldn't take it all out. And he said the portion that's there has not changed in 15 years. It looks exactly like the one that we did post-op. And he said, so you don't need any more MRIs. I'm not going to give you a future appointment. If you have any problem, we'll look at it then. But you don't need to be followed right. anymore. So Very 15 good. years, I've gotten that off. Very good. Yeah. So it was because of that 1993 tumor that in 1998, I decided to retire. Sure. Right. I had, uh, because of having the, the pituitary not secreting any hormones, I have to replace them all myself. Sure. And cortisone is uh, very difficult to keep from getting too much. And as so many problems with all these balls in the air, you know, uh, I just uh, was better. decided I needed to sure. live a slower life. So in a, in answer, that's a long answer to your question about what are you doing now. Sounds good. That's um, very, it's very rewarding. I've put down some of those balls. But, uh, <laughs> and Jan and I have, uh, we're Enjoyed every at day. our church here. And we've, Jan's folks, Jan grew up in Iowa. And her folks retired in 1970 and moved to, to uh, Arizona and build a house there and then eventually years later build a second house and um, dad died her dad died in uh, 1989 and her mother in 92 so we inherited the property and so that has become our winter home in Arizona oh that's nice and so when we start going there we we visited all the different churches and finally settled on a church and and uh, when uh, People ask, what do we call you? And I said, Lynn. And they said, what kind of work have you done? I said, medical education. And uh, then uh, the next year, and so they call me Lynn. And uh, I told Jan, I said, you know, my mother up in heaven is unhappy with me because she, I was to be called Doc. And <laughs> so <laughs> the senior pastor that retired, he and his wife uh, were on their way to uh, West Point where their grandson was. and said they were coming through Indiana and like to stop and see us so they spent a few days with us and we took them around our friends and all of my friends called me doc and uh, uh, we went to church and the pastor called me doc and uh, everybody and they said you don't go by Lynn in Indiana oh uh, and then they asked one of my friends why do you call him doc and he said well probably because he's a doctor and they said Oh, uh, you were you were you a practicing doctor? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so they went back to Arizona to tell the congregation, you know, <laughs> you know, that's a doctor. <laughs> Lynn is a doctor. A real life yeah, one, right? right. <laughs> and so, uh, so one day I told Jan, I said, you know, Jan, I have stepped away from medicine completely. I'm not doing anything in medicine whatsoever. And I said, you know, I think this whole little thing that we just went through with the uh, uh, Pastor Nate and his wife, and uh, I think God's telling us that, uh, similar to what Dr. Charles uh, Stanley, the Baptist minister uh, that we've, we've met, uh, he often tells people, you never really retire. God gives you gifts, and God expects you to use those gifts for others' benefit the rest of your life, and you never really retire. And I said, maybe I've looked at it wrong. Maybe I should, should say, I'm here to help people. And once people knew I was a physician there in Arizona, they started asking me questions about their own health. And I said, maybe I should be the patient's advocate. Maybe I should do what God is talking about. Mm. And so that's what our life has been. And we started, we like to do cruises. We started to cruise uh, with Dr. Stanley as Christian cruises. And we just last month did our fourth, our third Alaska cruise with him. And he takes over the whole ship, replaces all the entertainment with Christian entertainment, quartets, vocalists, uh, um, ventriloquists, Christian ventriloquists, um, um, 
comedians and the and nice the, enjoyable. And he has Bible study and he has uh, sermons and so on for mm -hmm. a whole week. It's a a retreat. It's just really neat, yeah, and so we've done that, and and we took uh, probably probably one of the other than the day I was born. Uh, probably one of the greatest things in our lives was doing the journeys of Paul with him in in uh, Turkey and Greece. That was wonderful. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I, really I've heard good. people say that. Yeah, That's that nice. was really good. My final thing: uh, mm -hmm. got an outstanding event in your life. If something comes to mind. Uh, that journeys of Paul was one. Okay. Um, God saving my life in several times. Right. Uh, the tumor being one, but another time, uh, I also have an army career. Uh, when I was doing my internship at Methodist, in order to be a, that was the time of bad times in the world, and uh, in order to be in a in a internship to be accepted into an internship you had to belong to some kind of, of a reserve unit mm -hmm. and so um, and that was time when when we were eligible for the draft the draft right. was in effect you know so you they did not want their interns to all to be drafted all of a sudden so you had to be in a, so uh, um, the 113th medical battalion of the 38th infantry division of the Indiana National Guard was headquartered in Indianapolis so most of the fellows there who were in medicine uh, were, were part of that. Yeah. So I joined the Indiana National Guard at that time, and uh, out of that time, I spent nine years with them. And uh, one of my assignments was uh, when the Vietnam War came along, was uh, um, being sent to uh, Panama for training. And uh, while we were in training there, um, I was the ranking officer, and uh, they were teaching us to repel. We had this 200-foot waterfall, and so they, the uh, we were attached to the Green Berets at that time, and so they sent me over first to show the rest of the troops how you do it. Well, this ancient waterfall had grooved; the water had grooved into the the rock. These grooves like this, and it was really slick. And just as I went over the thing, my feet slipped. And the, my feet went up in the air, and uh, the rope left my my snap ring broke, and and left me hanging with only my right hand, looking down 180 feet or so straight down upside down over this waterfall, and nothing but my right hand on this rope, and I'm hanging there praying, and the two green berets. I call them Tarzan and Jane, came out of the trees on their ropes, swung under me, uh, got under me, flipped me upside down, and said, let go of the rope now, Major. And I said, I can't. My wrist, my hand is just holy. It won't let go. And they said, you got to let go. I said, I can't. They had to pry my hand off. We went down to the bottom of the waterfall. We took the jungle trail back out through the jungle, came back to the top, and they said, okay, now you're going to do it again and show the troops how to do it correctly. <laughs> Don't let your feet slip. Keep your feet wide. Don't let them get into the grooves. So I did it. God saved me that time. That was an important event in my That's life. Right. <laughs> I agree with you on yeah. that. Yeah, and probably, uh, <laughs> probably the most fascinating. Um, we had that grand, the granddaughter that I mentioned back in the, fifteen years ago. Um, she graduated from uh, univ from uh, Chapel East Chapel Hill High School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in June. So that was great to be with her. And uh, with her being so far away from us, we didn't spend a lot of time with her. Well, our youngest daughter um, didn't marry till she was 39, and her, her she had a baby in, when she after she was 40, and so that child is now three years old and lives at Noblesville, Indiana. So when we're back in Indiana, such as now. Every Monday, we spend the day as That's grandparenting nice. in Noblesville with Katie, and yeah. and that is a delight. That is, that's right. That His is family really means a, a lot. Yeah. That's really a delight. Any closing comments that, that you'd like to share? Uh, well, one um, that I've always emphasized to medical students. Um, I mentioned earlier in high school I pursued music, 
percussion and I started playing in the first dance band that Marion High School had so I got used to playing in dance band as a drummer and uh, I've played all the rest of my life I have played as a drummer in many different bands so when I came to town the, the local doctors had a band the Krusty Crumbs and I played the drums with them most of them are deceased except for Harley Fry and me the piano player and me and uh, we got together with uh, this two years ago here uh, we played for 25 years together and then everybody started dying off but uh, Harley came across his chest of music and he he got uh, dark, uh, several different ones like uh, McGuire from McGuire Music, uh, uh, some of the local uh, band teachers in the local schools mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we got together and spent a night playing entertaining out at the university place here in town. Oh, really? Had a great time with I that. I bet you did. That's nice. And then uh, uh, back in the early 70s, um, it would, that reminds me of a couple things. Uh, in the early 70s, when we first, I was first on campus and, and there was no place for me, Dean Andrews uh, emptied one of the offices over in the graduate school and put me at a desk in there and let me use his secretary as my secretary. That happened right at the time that uh, Hovde retired and Art Hansen came. Well, they were redoing Hovde Hall and so they had no place for Art Hansen. So uh, um, Andrews asked me, would it be possible if Art used the other half of my big desk and I used one side and he used the other side until he got into Hovde Hall? <laughs> and so for several weeks, Art and I faced each other in this That's office an interesting at story. one desk. That's an interesting story. And we, uh, Jan and I have, as I mentioned about cruising, uh, we've taken several trips with the Purdue art people out uh, to Europe and so on. And uh, we also have taken some ambassador trips. And one of the ambassador cruises was uh, we got on the ship and we go to the assigned table for dinner and Art and Nancy Hansen are on it. And they're assigned to the same table we are. And so we're sitting there and Art says to Nancy, I don't think you've ever met Lindley. And she says, no. And he says, you know, I want you to meet Lindley. She looks at him and says, well, how do you know Lindley? And he says, well, he's, he's one of our Purdue people. He's the head of the medical education program. He said, you know, he and I shared the desk here before I got into the president's office. <laughs> <laughs> That's Not only the desk, but the same secretary for a while. <laughs> he said. We each had our own end, right? Yeah, we. <laughs> and he said, but you know, the okay. nice thing about it was, Nancy, that he's the only person, the faculty member on the on the Purdue campus, that I didn't have to pay any money to, because IU was paying his salary. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, one minute left. Okay, one uh, one closing thing then uh, was for the medical students. I've always encouraged them, whatever you have done musically, keep it going. It's nice relaxation. It's just a fun thing you can do when you're in medicine. You've got lots of pressures. And if there's something that you've loved to do with musically, do it. Or whatever else it is, do it. Good idea. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. This concludes it. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank very you. nice.